Good morning, Crosspoint. Church family. You know, we all belong to each other because we love the Lord together and we're part of the, the larger sense of the family, and that's a beautiful thing. I want to welcome you here this morning. I want to also welcome those who are watching or will be watching via the internet and via the TV channel. Uh, it's so good to be with you this morning. My name is Hank Bilstra. Uh, I'm one of the elders of this church, and I'm surrounded by people who are going to share in ministry as we sing together and as we have a time of, of worship and joy on this Pentecost Sunday, uh, 2024. I almost said 19, but that, that was a long, long time ago. So welcome, and let's begin with singing as our music group leads us with Holy, Holy, Holy. join together as we remain standing in the call to worship. You'll see it on the screen, the part that's written in bold, please, or yellow, I guess. Um, share that as you say, and I will lead in the, uh, the other part. The God of the whirlwind and of fire sweeps into our presence in this hour. Glory be to God who strengthens us. God who called all the world into being calls forth new life in us today. Glory be to God, in whose creative purpose we are claimed and empowered. God, whose spirit unites all people in a common language of love, confirms God's gifts in us as we gather here. Glory be to God, who created a life in which we can walk in confidence. Amen. 
So let me share with you the greeting. Our only help, and you know we really understand this, our only help is in the name of the Lord God Almighty, who made heaven and earth and who made your heart and mine, made our lives to respond to his word, to his glory, by the inspiration and the joy of his spirit. So grace, mercy, and peace be unto you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Um, it's Holy, 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 My Heart. We're going to sing it in English first, and then there are going to be four other languages, I think, five other languages projected on the screen. Pick whichever whatever one you like, and we're going to sing that through twice together in or choose your own language if you have a different one. All right? We'll just um, sing in tongues today. <laughs> time for our prayer. Would you like to be seated? So this is also an interactive prayer. So, so today, you got to pray with your eyes open. You good with that? Yeah? All right. Let's, let's share in this prayer together. It's a prayer of Pentecost. Spirit of God, we have gathered together here in this place to pray. Give us faith. Give us courage that we may not fear the tongues of flame. Let all that is unworthy, impure, and sinful be burned from our lives. May we know that it is love that burns so brightly and love that strips away our sin. Give us an open mind, Lord, that the truth that you bring may make its home within us. Give us an open heart, Lord. That we may see all people for your will and set the limits to the proclaiming of your word. Holy Spirit, with the whole church, we wait for you in every place and every generation. Come wind, come fire, come truth, come love. In, in Jesus' name. Amen. I agree. So as we continue, uh, we have time to confess our sins before Almighty God. And this is something that uh, one of the great preachers of yesteryear said, we need to keep short accounts with God, because God walks with us. And as we walk in obedience, he helps us to understand how near he is and how much we need him. So we say, come. Holy Spirit, us. come holy breath, Live in us. come holy wind, Move through us. for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Where we are led by other impulses, we become slaves to him, and our way of being is guided by fear. 
Where we are guided by prejudice. Fill us with love. Where we are guided by pessimism. Fill us with joy. Where we are guided by misunderstanding. Where we are guided by superficial quick fixes. Where we are guided by self interest. Where we are guided by apathy. Where we are guided by convenience. Where we're guided by complacency. Where we're guided by temptation. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Breath. Come, Holy Wind. Move through us. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. I, I did come back, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so next Sunday, we're, we're all going to march together, right? Yeah, okay. Well, I don't know that for sure because, you know, I, I won't be the pastor that's preaching that day. Uh, pray that uh, God will bless Pastor Harold and his family and all of those who are uh, worshiping different places and... Let's just give our hearts to God as we listen to the rest of Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 22 to 40, and then prepare to, uh, to enter into the message. So it's Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 40, and uh, this is what God's word says to us. Men and women of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, by wonders, by signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I won't be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, sisters, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. His tomb is here with us today, but he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he did not abandon him to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God had raised Jesus, has raised Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. 
exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David didn't ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be his name. Let's, let's pray together. Lord God, this is a wonderful piece of scripture, but also very serious in terms of the message of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that your word is never idle. Your word always speaks to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to think through what you are saying to us this morning. And may the words of my lips, the meditation of our hearts, may it be acceptable in your sight, Lord. And Lord, help us not to get distracted but to really listen for your voice as we share about your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the message is entitled this morning, Pentecostal Spirit. It's the promise that God sent his Holy Spirit and that it would make a difference, that he would give spiritual power from the very throne, from the very heart of God. And you know, there's times in life when we don't think about that very much. There's also times of life that we think about it very, very much. I've seen that in hospitals. I saw it when I fell flat on my face and I didn't look so pretty afterwards. Uh, when, when my heart gave me trouble, you know, I just went right on the ground. Laid there for five minutes. The doctor said, you know, most people don't wake up from that. And I'm going, Oh, Lord, thank you. I had a very clear sense of his, of his presence. But when we're in hospitals, often when it's serious, you know, we are spiritual beings. And, and, and I've seen that even people who don't reflect on the fact that God might exist believe in the resources of their spirit, believe that there must be something, believe that there needs to be something to hold on to. You know, I, I'm old enough, I watch Star Wars. Anybody here ever watch Star Wars? Or a derivative thereof? There sure is a lot of them, right? May the force be with you, you know? And, and I love the way Darth Vader breathes, but that's another story. But Star Wars movies are all about, really, all about spiritual power to help me in this world that I face. So at the hospitals or maybe even in the movie theater. You know, there are times when we are confronted with realities that we don't always think about. And as we are sick, you know, and we come alongside people who are struggling, we try to help people to find the spiritual resources, to find uh, peace and to find meaning and to find a sense of hope in their situation. We do that because God has made us, we, we are hope-making, hope-believing, hope-seeking people. You know, and every human being needs this and every human being does this. You know, the disciples were pretty human too. And they had a lot of questions about spiritual reality as they walked with Jesus through those three years and especially through the last part of it. And there's a lot of stuff they needed Jesus' help with. And even right after or right before his ascension, they were asking about power and, and authority. And, and, you know, they had a sense that he might be leaving. And how's the story going to continue? What are we going to do? Lord, and the question comes in Acts 
uh, 1 uh, verse 6, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, do we finally get to throw those Romans out and whack them real good and, and teach them that it's the kingdom of David that is most important? The kingdom of God? You know, they were bringing this question, interpreting this in, in terms of authority over government and, uh, you know, the, the, the rules and the laws that were made and the economics and the politics and, and, and the Romans, you know, were so resented and there was a heart longing of the people to be free. But even after all of Jesus' teaching and his example about our spirit, uh, you know, they still had a material and a political concept about what the kingdom of God should be. That's not so unusual. We want to be in control. And we're not ever going to be in control. The best we can do is trust God. The best we can do is follow him and seek what he has to say to us. So when Jesus answered their question about authority and power by saying that they would receive a spiritual power and the energy of God for the accomplishment of God's work in the world, that was quite a catch-up in their minds. He was referring to Pentecost, and they would understand better when the Spirit came, but it was sort of a head-scratcher for a while. You know, the precious promise of, of Acts chapter uh, 1 is, is that the Spirit would come and we would receive power and we would be busy in the kingdom of God. But we need to let that truth dwell in our hearts and in our minds continually. It was, and it is, God's plan that we have his divine energy, his personhood, in our lives and in our hearts, that we have his strength to do his will, because I can't do that on my own and neither can you, but that we have his strength and his person in our lives in the world today because we need to live and we've been called to live as spiritual witnesses and make a difference spiritually in the relationships we have. There's a couple of reasons for that, and I'd like to stress that. First of all, Pentecost means that power is available in the life of the believer. You know, the divine event that, that took place on the day of Pentecost was really, really important. You know, the church was made up of a few Galilean peasants, and, and it was divinely touched and, and identified by the people of God through whom... God would carry out his redemptive plan and share the story. And I heard the babble this morning. And you know, we've, I've, I've never been part of a skit like that. And I'm thinking, wow. The story spread in so many ways and, and, and it rivets your attention. So as the church spilled out onto the street and, and the community started to ask, well, how come we're hearing this in our, I don't think those Galilean guys speak my language when I'm still hearing my language. What's going on? God was speaking to the heart. You know, the church made up of just a few people from Galilee spoke to the hearts of so many from everywhere. You know, on the day of Pentecost, the church became the one body of Christ. And it was empowered to do God's work in the world. What's God's work in the world? Well, they received the power of a new insight and understanding of what the death and resurrection of Jesus really meant. That we could be forgiven. That evil is uh, something that will not hold its chains on our neck. And that that power is broken. Secondly, they received the power of a new courage that gave them boldness and a sense of authority. You know, where Peter stood before the Sanhedrin and he said, I don't know if it's right to listen to you or to listen to God. Well, I do know that it's right and I'm sure not going to listen to you. And they were beaten that day. And they rejoiced because God had done a powerful work in them and enabled them to be a witness fearless and true. And he gave them boldness, a sense of authority and witnessing to the mighty acts and works of God. Thirdly, they received the power of a new conviction, 
about the lostness of people. It became really important to them to see that the people around them were lost in sin and Christ had come to do something about it and he had sent us to do his work and we are called to this and we need to go and tell the story. And fourthly, they received a new sensitivity to the needs of hurting humanity. You know, time was they wouldn't speak to the, uh, to the Samaritans because the Samaritans were so far below them. Ew, I don't even want to deal with you. Ooh. You know, like I sort of step back from people and make sure they didn't infect you because you rub shoulders with them. You know, that's an attitude that humanity has. We tend to look down on people. We tend sometimes to, to draw back when we would do so much good if we walked near and shared a little bit of love and a little bit of care in Jesus' name. So Pentecost means that power to do all these things is available, to experience all that. Second thing it means is that the power of the Holy Spirit is not a just then thing. It's a thing that's needed now as well. It's a timeless thing. You know, our Lord promised divine power to his church then and now. So the power of the Holy Spirit is needed if we're going to overcome evil. That's a personal thing. That's also a thing in our society and in our neighborhoods and in, in the things that, that we encounter in life. You know, there's evil within us. And we need to pray for God to remove that and to deal with that and keep us on the straight and narrow. There's evil all around us and we need to speak up for justice and right and for Jesus' uh, proclamation of truth. You know, our only hope of being able to, to put to death the sins of our flesh, the body, you know, what, what we do, the mind, what we think about, the words we say, and to experience the fruit of the Spirit is through the power that comes from God. But that means we need to have an active relationship with God, not just the, yeah, I believe, sort of, but it's he's my Lord. I follow him. I know him, and he knows me. And we're with each other all day, every day. So in my time of need, he is there. In my time of question, he's there. In my time of struggle, in my time that I think the, that, and I know I've failed, he's there. And the hand that holds me is the hand that will restore and forgive. But in order for those things to happen, I need to bring it all to him. I need to daily depend on him and not on my own strength. When I was 21, I thought, well, you know, this religion thing is nice, but if I got to fix anything, it's got to be me that does it. I spent two, three years, four or five years discovering that that wasn't true at all. But he met me when I was ready to give in and to understand that it's more than me. Secondly, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is needed to overcome our enemy, the devil. Have you ever seen him with his pitchfork and his cute red suit and his big smile? You know, that's how he's portrayed in the comics. That's how he's portrayed sometimes uh, in, in the media. And people sometimes don't take him very seriously. But he works overtime to destroy our spiritual life to wiggle into our relationships and rip them apart, you know, to, to, to take our, our thinking to places where it shouldn't be and to frustrate us in our spiritual life. You know, Jesus was confronted by him many times, and every time again, he took him back to what Scripture said, and he took him back to the promises of God. And that's where we need to stand. The disciples throughout the ages have been hindered and hurt by him. But those who have been comforted and stood on the word of God, they have been brought to victory. He's a very real influence. That's why Jesus said to Peter, watch and pray, because the devil has desired to sift you, and he will. But I have prayed for you. The power of the Holy Spirit is necessary today also because our task is really, really big. 
You know, we've been commissioned as witnesses in Jerusalem. That means here in our neighborhood and with those close to us and our families. We've been commissioned to take it to Samaria, to be with those that we've considered enemies or are not worth dealing with, people we feel alienated from, people we have prejudices. We don't have prejudices, do we? No. Sometimes it's so close to our, our, like we don't even see it until somebody says, you know, that wasn't really the best way to handle that. What's your attitude all about? You know, and then we take it to Judea. That means in the country, in the province, in the city, across the world. You know, as, as followers of Jesus, we have to have a heart of concern that's big enough for the world. And that's why we have Resonate Global Ministries. That's why we have uh, prayer times together. That's why we have opportunities to go serve. That's why so many things. Because the church is, is an active community that responds to the call of God. He calls us to stewardship, to share the gospel truth, to live our lives in such a way that, that we are, are able to bless and influence others. And all of this comes as we submit to and depend on the Spirit um, to come upon our lives. So the power of the Holy Spirit is vital. And what he does is he helps us to grow spiritually. You know, so, so often we're, we're focused on those, those insecure questions of, well, can I really do it? No, let's take this person to the minister, because only the minister can really witness. You ever felt that way, that you felt inadequate about sharing the story of your life with Jesus? Or will, will they like me? Will they close the door in my face? I'm not sure I can deal with that kind of rejection. Will they control me? Will they try? Will, will they hurt me? You know, we, we need to work through a lot of that stuff and come out the other end in a place where we can trust and take Jesus at his word, where we can link arms with fellow believers and, and appreciate each other, differences and all, and disagreements and all. And each of us can use our gifts for God's purposes. That's why Paul focused on the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Close your eyes. Please, trust me, okay? Nothing's going to happen. Just close your eyes. Okay, I want you to think for a moment about which of these words reflects best what happens in your life or needs to happen. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then Paul says in just such an endearing way, he says, yeah, against such things, there's no law. Well, yeah, that's for sure there's no law against that because these are the things that draw people nearer to us and nearer to God. So think about how God can use that in your life, the thing that, that caught your interest as I read those words. You know, this describes Christ's character, and the Holy Spirit has come to reproduce in us the character and the love and the security of Jesus and the reactions of Jesus. You know how the rich young ruler, Jesus loved him and the man still couldn't trust Jesus for what was asked, couldn't understand, didn't ask a question, just walked away. How sad that is. But as we trust Jesus and come near to him, you know, it, it leads to all parts of our lives and all parts of the, the body of Christ becoming a community that would work together to build each other up, to help each other, to empower each other, to go and to do what God leads us to do without criticizing. Boy, we're good at that, aren't we? Because we all have different opinions. So let's do value added instead of second guessing. Let's appreciate each other because God will bless us loving and appreciating each other and, and bringing extra value to what happens as he uses us. That's why the Spirit came. 
That's why he remains, to make us one in spirit and one in truth, one in the Lord. So let's bring this in for a landing, shall we? You know, if, let me ask you a question. Is the Holy Spirit a reality in your life? Are you aware as a believer, as one who loves Jesus, that your body and your life is the literal dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? Right here and everywhere else. If you want to experience the power and the direction you need to believe in and to work with his presence in you, are you willing to let him do that in your life? Like really willing? If you want to experience his power, do you have the faith to believe in the benevolent purposes, the goodwill purposes of the Holy Spirit in your life? He didn't come to make you a religious fanatic, but he came and he comes and he abides to bring to fulfillment the potential beauty and the fragrance that Jesus can produce in a person's life. You know how when you've been with somebody who really cares about you and shares the love of God with you, that there's something good that remains after as you go and think about what happened between you. You know, God calls us not to self-confidence and not to pat ourselves on the back, but to God-confidence and seeking in him the approval that can only come as we follow him. So to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to, it's a relationship. We need to respond to him and cooperate with him as he seeks to lead us in service to God and to others. And the promise of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, if we claim it and experience it and live it out for him and for others each day, we will have power to be witnesses everywhere that he sends us and everywhere where we find that he is already at work. And he is at work in our community, in our church, in our family. We just need to look for his hand. And you know, one of the most beautiful statements that, that Jesus ever said that speaks to my heart is he, he said to his disciples, I work where I see that my father is at work. Find where your father is at work and get busy because his Holy Spirit will bless you as you follow his leading. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you today and we thank you, Lord, that it is your spirit that lifts us it is your spirit, Lord, that cuts through the darkness and the questions. It is your spirit that envelops us, Lord, in, in times of pain, in times of difficulty, in times, Lord, when we can't form words to say what we're feeling. But you are there, and you know. You lift us, Lord, in the arms of faith. You give us, Lord, that sense that we are your children. We are lifted in the arms of God by the one who carries us along. Lord God, we're all familiar with that story about the beach and the two tracks of footprints. We thank you, Lord, that there is never a time that you are not at our side and that there is never a time that you don't lift your children to your heart. Lord, we ask that some of that will rub off on us too. Help us to be encouragers. Help us to be kind. Help us to be truthful gently. Help us, Lord, to, to be people that can be depended on, people who love and people who serve and, and people, Lord, who are the same today as tomorrow. Help us, Lord, to be real with each other. Help us, Lord, not to be this way one day and that way another, because these are hurtful things. But help us to be steady with you 
and to be a blessing to the people that you have given us to love in your name. Guide us, we pray. Bless our pastor, we pray. Thank you for, for uh, his work and thank you, Lord, for Chad who has come to be with us. Thank you, Lord, for the many, many ways your grace has lived out. For this congregation, for you have called us all to make a difference in your name and to be witnesses wherever you send us, wherever we are. Help us to live that out by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing together. like to share with you in the words of the Lorica. You see on the screen behind me, the Lorica is a breastplate prayer. It's an ancient form of prayer for protection that invokes the power of God as a safeguard against evil. The St. Patrick's breastplate is one of the more well-known Loricas. The one we're going to share today is the one of St. Fursi, an Irish missionary to Anglo-Saxon England way back in the seventh century, and that's the thing about scripture. Scripture then, scripture now. It's in the moment, and it's real. Let's share this together. The arms of God be around my shoulders, the touch of the Holy Spirit upon my head, the sign of Christ's cross upon my forehead, the sound of the Holy Spirit in my ears, the fragrance of the Holy Spirit in my nostrils, the vision of heaven's company in my eyes, the conversation of heaven's company on my lips, the work of God's church in my hands, the service of God and neighbor in my feet, a home for God in my heart, and to God, the Father of all, my entire being. Amen. 
So as we depart this place and as we think about refreshments after, as we think about maybe getting together at Rinkamas tonight, there's many blessings to experience in life. Go forth to be a blessing. May the blessing of God the Father, of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and of the Holy Living Spirit of God, the one who lifts us and shows us his way, be with you and stay with you today and all the tomorrows as you go forth to be witnesses and as we follow his word together. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.